seen him in something. Um, he has uh, been known for a hundred different uh, productions uh, throughout his career. Oscar nominee as well. Um, known as a character actor. Um, started his career as studying uh, in Syracuse. Uh, worked with Second City. Uh, improv group in Chicago. And, and then countless, <coughs> countless uh, um, TV shows as well, Breaking Bad, you might remember from, uh, you know, played uh, Kramer's alter ego, I guess, in, in uh, Seinfeld, and, and many others. So we're going to talk to uh, Larry Hankins. Let's give a hand to uh, Larry right here. And welcome to Scott Hancock. Thank for showing up. And, 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 Larry, and Larry, let's start, let's start it off uh, this way. You know, I, I was looking through your IMDb DB database uh, of all the different comedy actors you worked with. I mean, Let's, I'm just going to toss out a few. Obviously, Jerry Seinfeld, Bob Newhart, Ed Asner, George Burns, the list goes on. Woody Allen, Adam Sandler. What did you take from working with that broad range of, of comedic, comedic talent? I'm not good enough. <laughs> I mean, just it, oh, you know, oh, uh, what did I take from them? Oh, the concentration of folks. That, that you just gotta keep going. I remember, I used to be a, uh, I consider myself a stand-up comedian, not, a, uh, not an actor, really. Uh, so what I took from, because I used to cross paths with uh, Albert Brooks and Richard Pryor and George Carlin and all, all those good comedians who back in the day I really loved and grew up laughing. When I started working with them, or working on the same uh, nightclub circuit, so I would come in a day before and watch them, they would come in a day before and watch me, or a night before and watch me, um, is their dedication to their craft. Um, I used to get pulled off by, uh, on the stage by police, because I was doing Richard Pryor and Minnie Bruce type of stuff. I wasn't stealing from them, but we were talking about the same thing, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Uh, and back in the day, you couldn't do that, uh, and you couldn't get on television. So all this stuff is, makes what we were doing seem like, I mean, the stuff that you see on television now, just uh, inconsequential. So what I took from those guys was they were booed on the stage all the time. Uh, nobody showed up for their uh, nightclub you know, gigs all the time. But they, they kept on going. Right? Pryor was just amazing. I mean, his, his, fo his focus is, because it's a need. It's, it's not a want. It's a need. So that's what I took from them, that if you want to do it, you're not going to do it. If you need to do it, you probably will. So whatever you want to do, just keep that in mind. If you want to do it, it's not enough. Just like love is done. Uh, okay, next question. Is, is a guy like Richard Pryor the same on and off stage, or, or was he a little, uh, was it, you hear sometimes where um, artists are, are very quiet off stage, and when they see the lights, they just a completely different persona. Um, yeah, and that does happen, but it's not always the same. Um, like, for me, I'm pretty quiet off stage, but if I'm talking to somebody, all of a sudden there's something that clicks. I don't know what it is because I have nothing to do with it. And then all of a sudden I'm on, and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, you, you just you just on. So some of them are quiet, and some of them are always on. I mean, one of the reasons I left comedy, the stand-up field, and I went into I joined Second City was because um, I saw that I had stopped having conversations. What comedians do is they try out material. They're not talking to you. They're, they're, they're trying out their next hunk. And uh, I was in uh, L.A. at the, uh, I think it was at the Improv, the nightclub comedy store. Um, and uh, there was a whole bunch of comedians and we were at the bar and we were just having a conversation, and I suddenly realized 
nobody here is talking to each other. We're all trying out material. And that's, so I, I, I quit. I, I went into acting. That, that's why I did. Um, now that I'm out of acting, well, I, I, I mean, I'm doing my own stuff now. I make my own little movies, and I work with just friends now as an actor. I'll do sitcoms, but I don't like to audition anymore. It's a demeaning process. Um, but uh, every once in a while, I want to go back on the stage. I, I want to go back on the stage. But then when I start needing to go back on the stage, I can tell that's clicked in because I stopped having conversations. I now am testing out material on other people. So that, that's what I know. I worked. Um, and I've started to do that lately. Uh, that's because I've been writing uh, a one-man show and a book. I just wrote a book. Just my thoughts and stories and stuff about people like that. Funny stuff. Satirical stuff, satire. Uh, but in writing the book, I started to write funny stuff. And once you're writing funny stuff, you want to do it. And that's what started to happen get the juices going again. And I had dropped that stuff a long time ago. Eventually, I'll, I'll get back on the stage. It, it, it's, it's the riskiest thing in the world, being a stand-up comedian, because all you've got between you and the audience is this. And sometimes you don't have this. Not when you're doing luncheons and stuff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, but I was being, I mean, I was also being pulled off the stage and, and, and st having stuff thrown up. But if you know the old uh, auditorium seats, the old ones with, with the wooden armrests that were on the steel supports, you could take them off. You could knock them off and slide them out that way. And I was playing Washington University uh, down in uh, Missouri, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, with the Love and Spoon Ball. I was opening for the Love and Spoon Ball. And I was doing sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Hey, it's a rock and roll band. Hey, you know, it's 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 a uh, college. Hey, you know. And I just said, I, I have clean material too, but you know, it just goes in and out. I don't differentiate. It's either funny or it's not. But when I got through the clean stuff, not for any reason that I wanted to open the clean stuff. It's just that you judge by. You have a rhythm to it. The rhythm was start with this stuff and then go to this stuff. So when I got to the God stuff, the religious stuff, um, they go, no, no, they were laughing. It was it was going well. And then all of a sudden I said, okay, let's talk about God now. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, here's a little guy. We invented this. I, I just made this little guy. He's a little guy, you know. Oh, he's all naked. Let's put him on. Let's just stand there. How you doing? You know, oh, you don't have any clothes on. What's that between your legs? Boo, 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 but they were throwing, th they started to take their armrests off and throw the wooden armrests and throw them at the stage, the first two rows. So that was kind of crazy. The Love and Spoonful were off behind the curtain, they were laughing their asses up there in their wings. They were, oh, no, do, do the dirty stuff, do the dirty stuff. They were saying, do the clean stuff. Do. So I said, okay, okay, I'll do the clean stuff, I'll do the clean stuff. So they calmed down and they, um, and so I said, I did more clean stuff. You know, skipped around. And, then, and they came right back. They were laughing and it was going along great. And then I said, okay, let's now talk about religion. No, okay, that's it. And the guys in the back, the guys, no girls, the guys in the back were taking off their armrests and passing them down. <laughs> All the ones in the front had no armrests. Like, we just scattered around the, well, okay. The time between the first time they threw the stuff and the second time was approximately 10 to 15 minutes. As I, they were throwing the stuff, and I was saying, no, 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 listen, yeah, do the, do the religion, no, no. All of a sudden, a phalanx of cops, 10 cops down this aisle and 10 cops down that, that, that aisle, came up onto the stage and escorted me off the stage. 
And I figured out, we figured out that between the first time that they started filming stuff, the dean was in the back. It was a university, it was, you know, college. Dean was in the back and he called the police immediately. It took him 10 minutes to get there, so by the time I got to my second dirty material, religious stuff, the, the cops were there, lined up in the back, and at the time I was doing clean stuff, so they just waited. They did not, we can't take them off the stage. It's not doing anything. And then I did the Lenny Bruce stuff, you know. <laughs> my down and, I'm not Lenny Bruce, I'm not Lenny Bruce. I wasn't even doing hard drugs at the time, so, they took me off the stage. Our next gig was Northwestern University, which was up in uh, Chicago. Uh, where? Chicago. Chicago, right, Northwestern. So we flew up there, got in the bus, and take the bus to the uh, uh, venue. Get to the venue. Uh, no, we get to the hotel. The bus pulls up to the hotel. There was a uh, five of us, a four eleven spoonful, four, yeah, four. and me, and then there was two. Um, Two managers, their managers, they were working the whole thing. So we get in and we get our, we, we, we check in, get our room keys, we're still in the lobby, and three men approach us. A police captain, a priest, and an, an elder gentleman in a suit. This was the dean of Northwestern. These three people said, um, is this the loving spoonful party? Yeah. And then the two managers immediately sensed problems and stepped forward and said, yeah, what's this about? And then the guy in the suit said, uh, which one of you is Larry Hankin? And they immediately turned to the five of us and said, go up to the room, lock yourself in, and don't come out until you hear from us. Don't open the door for anyone. And we just split. And they talked to these two people. About 15 to 20 minutes later, there's a knock at the door, it's us, it's us, it's the managers, we let him in. And here's what they tell us, okay, here's the deal. They don't want Larry to go on. They got a call from Washington University saying they have a filthy mouth comedian opening for them. So, they didn't want you to go on. We worked out a deal where, Larry, you can go on, but you have to do only clean material and if you do any dirty material, the police will pull you off the stage. We're going to turn off the lights, and that will be the end of you. So, just that's that's the deal we made. And then we walked out. So, loving spoon toy saying, "No, you got to do your dirty material. You got to do your dirty material." You know. So I I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I, you know, I just you know I'm just I just want to be I just want to make people laugh. I just want to. So I, I opened and I decided as I was walking on the stage, oh screw it, I just do my whole thing, whatever. So I did my entire act, the sex, the drugs, the rock and roll, whatever, the religion, everything. It went over great, you know, nothing happened. So that's, and, and then when I went to, the next gig was, uh, after the tour, was uh, Jerry's on the highway or Jack's on the highway outside Boston, just a nightclub. And there was a dance floor. You know, you know, in, in nightclubs, the the band plays on the on the stage is only that high, and there's a big dance floor, and you can't if you're performing, you can't see this beyond the dance floor because of the light. So it's just black. It's a clear dance floor. So I'm doing my stuff, and then I get to the same thing. The little guy, and hey, what's that between your legs? And I hear, I was opening for the uh, for uh, the Kingston Trio this time. So. Uh, I hear, and it was a, there was a blizzard outside, so there was no, it was like 20 people, it's like this, <laughs> and, but I couldn't see anybody, so I, I just started my thing, I was doing, and you could hear, ha 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 ha, a couple of people, and then I did my religious stuff, and then you hear, hey, bring on the Kingston Trio, and so anyway, you know, da, 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 sex, drugs, uh, marijuana, okay, hey, I said, bring on the Kingston Trio. We don't want to hear that crap. It's just this voice out of the blackness. And then, um, <laughs> then uh, I just ignored it. Because I don't have any rejoinders, you know, stoppers. You know, so. I just kept on going. Because there was a couple of people, and I didn't, you know, I, I didn't care. 
And then this guy, this ballpark, this like lumberjack, comes across the, the uh, dance floor with a beer bottle upside down in his fist, and he says, we want to hear the Kingston Trio get off the stage. So I did. You know, I just got off the stage. I mean, I'm not going to. So I go and I sit at the bar, and there was nobody at the bar except the bartender. And he immediately comes over and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, did you just see that? That guy came out with the peel bottle. He's going to hit me, man. And he was like halfway across the dance floor. Thank God it was a big dance floor. Um, and I said, no. so I'm not going to get into, where's the bouncer? And the bartender said, I'm the bouncer. You have 10 more minutes. Get back on the stage. And I said, no, man, I'm not getting back on the stage until you tell that guy not to do anything or get him out of the club. And he said, no, man, you have 10 more minutes, you're not going to get paid. And I said, I'm not going on the stage until you tell that guy something, anything. And he said, no, get back on the stage. The Kingston Trio is not coming out for 20 minutes. And I said, no. And he said, you're fired. And I said, OK. And I just walked out of the club into a snowstorm on the outskirts of Boston. So I walked back into the club. I got on the payphone. I called the cab. And I went home and I called my agent. And I said, look, police took me off the state. I'm a middle class Jewish kid who doesn't know anything about Lenny Bruce, except I think he's really funny. So I, I don't, you know, I can't do this anymore. So he said, well, join Second City. You can do the same amount of you know, material. They're doing exactly what you're doing, but they own the theater. So just join, you know, audition. But that's the only way you're going to, because cause he was also the manager for um, Woody Allen. And that, so I was opening for Woody Allen, too. And he said, well, you don't have any television material. You're doing this sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Woody isn't doing that. Uh, you know, you can work nightclubs, but I can't put you on television. Because Woody was doing television. And I just said, I can't put you on television. It just it's stuff. So I said, I don't know because I don't write. I don't know how to write comedy. I, 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 I don't have to write. But there's a structure, and writing is different than just off the top of your head, like I'm doing right now. Uh, so I would get up on the stage and just talk to people like I'm doing right now, and it would get funny, you know, because I work. You know. uh, so I said, I, uh, OK. So I, I auditioned for Second City and I got into that. And that's how I became an actor. It was just, it was just too nerve-wracking with, with the police. And, and I didn't understand it to this day. I don't understand why people, why you can't say fuck on television. I really, I mean, you can tell me why and I would nod my head. But I don't get it. I just don't get it. The whole thing, all of it. So I joined Second City, and then we opened, the, uh, and then a couple of us left and joined the committee, which was down in San Francisco for 10 years ago. And then all of it, and then Hollywood would just fly up and take us. And that's how, and then uh, after I was working, I didn't want to go. I, I wanted to stay in San Francisco. But that was like a third, a third generation uh, company by then, after five, five years. Pretty much everybody had left. I stayed for an, another couple of years. But then by then I was directing the show. So I just felt like there was five actors in between me and the audience. I didn't like directing at all. I, I just wanted to get there. Uh, so then I just went down and started doing sitcoms and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And that got me to here. Thank you, Larry. You know, that's why we only gave you a half hour, because, you know, it takes 10 minutes to get the cops from stopped in a PD to get here. So, yeah, so, so, so we only got about, you know, about five, you know, five, 10 minutes left, so you're okay, safe cool. now. So. so I'll make it really quick, well, whatever anybody else wants to uh, ask me. Uh, one, one question uh, that I thought was really interesting was the, the writing you did for the Outlaw Emmett Demons. Yeah. Um, tell me about how that came about. You did, you did about five different stories about it. As one writer, I guess, put it with the Don Quixote with a uh, motorcycle. Don Quixote on a motorcycle. Uh, on a motorcycle. A seven-year-old postmaster, or, uh, you know, retires and decides to go out no, and he was a, he was a, he was a, uh, he was a parking ticket oh, officer right, yeah. who rode a three-wheeler, so that made the, 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 the motorcycle thing. Where that came from was really simple. If you notice, I don't know if you have this, 
But women actresses, it at first occurred to me as women, but it applies to men. Women actresses, when they reach over 35, this is about 10 years ago, when they get to be 35, lead actresses, and then they start to push 40, so between 35 and 40, they start playing mothers on sitcom TVs because your cinema life is over. You know, you're too old. You know, I don't understand that either. Okay. So a lot of these actresses who I was watching, you know, in movies, they were starting to do TV sitcom moms. And I thought, and guys, it's around 50, 55. And then you, you start, they start showing up on TV. Well, I don't want to, you know, I just want a steady job. I just want to, you know, I don't want to work every, you know, just three months and then all. I want a steady job. So, okay, so to protect myself against that as a young man of about 29 or 30, I thought I will invent a character that I can do when they don't want me anymore. I'm not going to do a sitcom dad. You know, I'm not going to go to Brian Cranston route. He came out of it, you know, but he was doing sitcom dads. You know. uh, but he started out as a movie actor. So I didn't want to do that. So I invented a character, Don Quixote, on a motorcycle old guy, 70 years old, because Chaplin was 18 when he became Charlie Chaplin. But he played a 35-year-old tramp. But he was playing older. It's always better to play older, because he needed to older. So I thought, if I get a gray-haired guy on a motorcycle, I'm set for, you know, <laughs> I mean, gray hair. So that's why I wrote it. That's why I invented the character. And I like motorcycles. I used to have a motorcycle until I crashed. Uh, so that's why he's on a motorcycle, because I want to be a motorcycle. And I thought it would be really cool. I was thinking Route 66. I don't know if anybody knows Route 66. Well, that's the, that's the gist of, OK, he goes from town to town trying to get somewhere. He was trying to get to, um, um, what? Well, <laughs> Uh, well, what's the big thing in, up in uh, South Dakota, the, uh, the big motorcycle rally? Sturgis. He was going to Sturgis instead of New York, instead of east to west, or west to east. Uh, so he was going to Sturgis. So the, the sitcom would be, not the sitcom, but the camera show, the episode, but the hour show, would go from here to there. And, and we just have these adventures, he trying to fall in love, he's going to uh, So that's where that came from. I, I, I was always entertained because, you know, I, I, I always liked the that, that I wrote, I made, I made and it was, it was distributed all over the world. And Edie e. McClure, who, you know, uh, was, it, was in it with yes. you. I always, you always find her in different things. And they're just... Well, she's like me, you know. Yeah. She's just a, a great character. She just, uh, and, and um, uh, Ferris Bueller, she just uh, fucking blew me away with that character. And, and kind of, she kind of always did that character from then on. Uh, yeah, you just find your, your niche and you, you just do it. If you want to be a lead actor, you just find your own self and be that, if you want to be a lead actor. If you want to be a character actor, you find a, sort of a, a cartoon of yourself when you do that. So I'm trying to get to finding myself. And the new stuff I'm writing is just me. Uh, also, also a pre-made job too. It, it's a pre-made job, you know. You're writing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, no. It's really hard to write for yourself if you want to be real. Like, you know, to play yourself because you want to perform. And the whole point of being yourself is no, you can't. It's not that don't. It's you can't. And that's why sometimes if you just get normal people to be actors, you know, kind of fill in. They're great, because they don't know how to act, so they don't. And they're just themselves, and, and they come off really incredible. We've got a couple more minutes. Any uh, questions from the audience? You got a question? Yeah. Um, that scene in Billy Madison where you talk about Triscuits, does that feel like a commercial, or was that just like a, you like, oh, it's just lying? No, it's a, lo a lot of comedians, and, and uh, Adam Sandler is one of them. I don't like his humor. But as an actor, he's really incredible. Have, have you seen his new one? Um, Uncut Gems, yeah. 
whoa, are you kidding? And uh, a lot of his straight roles are amazing. Mm -hmm. But okay, so in the Triscuits thing, no, uh, because of who he is, he's a, he is a great comedian. I just don't think he's that kind of humorous funny, but he's a comedian. Uh, he's a funny guy. Um, you collect um, zeitgeist. It just goes here, man. You co collect the, the, the collective psychology of, of, of the country you're in, or the civilization you're in. And that just came out of Triscuits. Everybody knows Triscuits, and he just, you know, he just put it in. I'm, I'm sure that in the writing, it either he put it in or he just made that up on the set. Uh, but I do that too. If you notice, a, a, a lot of comedians have zeitgeist words, just that things that everybody know, just to keep you interested. To, to, to talk to you. But that's a good question. Yeah. And then, then final question uh, this morning. Um, you, you, you mentioned in one story I read about you was uh, Larry David, and yeah. you know how, how much you thought he was, you know, a genius, and how, and he was always thinking. Talk a little bit about that as we close. Okay, Larry Larry David is is amazing. Uh, I'll just tell you the story of my uh, situation with him. Uh, he, I, I got the job. I get on the set. Now, in, in, in TV sitcoms especially, uh, you don't necessarily meet the director when you audition. You audition for Suits or AIDS, A-I-D-E, and, uh, and on camera. And then the director will watch it. And sometimes the director that you watch is producers who hire actors. And when you get on the floor, <laughs> it's a surprise to everybody. You know, you and the director. Oh, you're, you're here. Well, they probably tell you. So when I got on the set, in my mind, that character, if you know that character, um, it's, um, I wanted to be dead to him. I, I thought he was so angry that to play anger, dead to him, would be really fine. Buster Keaton. I wanted to do Buster Keaton. I wanted to get to him and just do, and just say lines. But they were so angry that they came across it. It was, okay. So I'm, I'm on the set and I'm doing it now. Larry David doesn't direct direct. He, he coaches. He stands over there, the director's over here. The director's directing traffic and stuff on the cameras. So I, I did the one-to-one -one scene, I did one scene. And then Larry comes up to me. Now I have a chip on my shoulder and I have anger and I have attitude problems. That's just me. So Larry David comes up to me and says, I want to talk to my actor, which is great. You want that to happen. You know, and he puts your arm around and his arm around you and he takes you up to the side and you talk about the character and you know, the backstory. Uh, so he says, I want to talk to Larry. I'm like, great, this guy's great. And so he goes, uh, I know what you're doing. And he said it to me with such a accusatory, you know, I know what you're doing, that I got a chip on my shoulder immediately. And I said, Oh really? What am I doing? And uh, he said, you're trying to do nothing. And I was blown away because that's exactly what I was trying to do. And I went, he read my mind. I, so I, I go, oh, wow, yeah. And he goes, well, oh, you're doing something. And he walked away. The greatest piece of direction I've ever got. You're doing something. So I go, huh. And it, it registered. I, Okay, stop doing something. So we do it again. You know, Tom Simpson comes in. Tom's the real All right, let's do it again. All right, action. No, 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 cut. I want to talk to Larry. No, no, no. Cut. I thought everything's fine. Larry David's way over there. And then, as I'm standing there, I see him talk to Tom, and then he starts heading towards me. But really fast. Like he's not going to stop and talk to me. He's going to talk to that person over there. So he comes around, and as he comes by, he says, you're still doing it. And he just kept on going. Thank you, Larry. Larry, thank you, everyone. You will be upstairs on autographs. And there you go there. Thank you, Larry. I'm going to walk you up in a minute. Right now, we have a panel uh, talking about comments.